Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the investment committee, I just mentioned that this uh, item was prepared uh, to address your specific questions from last month's uh, investment education workshop. There were two questions raised back then. How do we formulate our capital market assumptions, mailing the expected returns? And why do we, uh, why do we say that the, expect the returns for the next 10 years is less likely to be as good as the past 10 years? And then the second question, what caused a market drawdown and how, dam how damaging a market drawdown can be? And more importantly, what, what can we do to prepare ourselves for a market drawdown? So these are the two questions. Um, first, how do we formulate capital market assumptions? How do we uh, forecast future uh, returns of major asset classes? Most people use a building block approach. So this approach, uh, uh, each asset class is viewed by its ability to uh, First, uh, to grow with uh, inflation. Okay, so I guess the animation is not working. Uh, let me go back. So the, as you see, the bottom block, the first block is inflation. So each asset class is viewed by its ability to grow with inflation, basically to preserve purchasing power. Then the second building block is to earn a risk-free rate, and normally people view a U.S. Treasury, a uh, U.S. government uh, uh, bonds rate as the risk-free rate. So these two blocks forms the foundation of the expected return of any major asset classes. And on top of that, then each asset class has a different uh, offers a different uh, risk premium, uh, such as equity premium. Uh, liquidity premium, uh, credit premium or spread uh, premium, and uh, uh, emerging market premium. So these are the normally the building block approach. For example, for public equity, you will see inflation, risk-free, and plus equity premium. For private equity, you will see inflation, risk-free rate, again, the, the two basic building blocks, plus equity premium and then e-liquidity premium, because private equity is less liquid than public equity. So this approach uh, offers a theoretical elegance, but in practice, it's difficult to estimate each uh, component of it, uh, as well as the correlation among them. So in practice, uh, fortunately, we have a simple yet effective indicator for each of the two major asset classes in our portfolio, which is the public equity and the fixed income. And as we, we know that in the long run, valuation is the variable that matters the most in terms of the future return in the long run, in the seven to the 10 years period, uh, the period that we are looking at. Um, for the, as I said, for the two largest asset classes, stock and bond, we have two very good uh, uh, empirical indicators to tell us what the future return is going to be uh, uh, look like. For a bond, yield to the worst or yield to maturity is a very good uh, indicator of future returns. And then for stock, the forward uh, earning yield is a good indicator of future returns as well. So this slide shows that you know how are our capital market assumptions relative to our peers. This slide shows um, the six major asset classes. The orange bar shows the range of our global peers from the um, largest survey available, uh, the Horizon survey. I believe it surveys 34 of our global peers. What's their capital mark, uh, market assumption? What do they expect to return in the future? And uh, for each major asset classes, and then the, uh, uh, the dot, the white dot in the middle is where we are. So the key takeaway on this slide is that our capital market assumptions is within the range of, uh, of the industry. And uh, also important to know that our during the 2017 asset allocation, uh, asset and liability management workshop, uh, we formulate our expected return for the next 10 years. For the next 10 years, the portfolio expected return is 6.1 percent, not 7 percent. And from the 11th to the 60 years, our uh, expected return is 6.3. Uh, I'm sorry, 8.3 percent. And if you take out of the uh, administrative expense and then average the first 10 years uh, plus from the 11th year to the 60 years, if you average them together, it turned out to be for the next 60 years, our expected return is 7%. But for the next 10 years, our expected return is 6.1%, not 7%. So this slide, when we say our expected return for the next 10 years of the portfolio is 6.1%, uh, it, this is not a point estimate. It comes with a wild, uh, wide 
range of distribution around 6.1%. The 6.1% is only the, the mean of the, uh, expect, uh, of the expected future return distribution. So this means that uh, I, you see the range in the middle, the 68%. So with 6.1% expected return and 11.4% of expected volatility, we would expect that 68% of the times in the future, our return will fall between 5.3% and 17.5%. And 95% of the uh, times that our uh, future return will fall between 16.7% and 28.9%. And you can go in, uh, for 99% of the time that our expected return falls between negative 28% and positive 40%. Uh, percent. Um, so there are three takeaways on this slide. For one, again, our 6.1% is not a point estimate with a, a wide range, so that no one we highlight this point so that no one is alarmed uh, by uh, realized future returns are different from 6.1% or from 7%. It's never meant to be a point estimate. The second point on this slide, as you can see on the left side, we are more concerned <coughs> with uh, left side the probability of a large drawdown. So that's what, might mean, what we mean by drawdown. And as you will see in a later slide, that drawdown can easily wipe, wipe out the returns, good returns from, uh, oh, from a couple of years. The third point is that the drawdown, the conventional risk management practice and framework, tends to underestimate the probability as well as the severity of a market drawdown. So that's the second part of the discussion this morning, the market drawdown. So as I said in the previous slide, that uh, for the two largest asset class in our portfolio, global equity and fixed income, we have, uh, e for each of them, we have a, a very sim a good and simple indicator for the future returns. The x-axis I show you that is U.S. Treasury real, rate, uh, real rates since 1962. And uh, as we said that for fixed income for bonds, the yield is a pretty good indicator of a future return. And the y-axis is the earning yield of a global equity, which is a good indicator for future return as well. As you can see that you know, on the upper right-hand corner, uh, where we have the happy face, so that's when, that was during 1981 recession. And at that time, as you can see that back then, U.S. Treasury offers a real yield about 8%, nominal yield about 14%. And uh, the equity earning back then, the forward earning yield is about 8% as well. So uh, these are real yield. Uh, and we, we put it together as a 60-40 portfolio. If you look at our portfolio today, it's not that different from 60-40 portfolio. When they say 60-40 means 60% roughly in equity exposure and 40% in bond exposure. So currently our portfolio in global equity is about 50% and private equity about 8%. Um, so all add up the equity exposure about 60%. And then our bond exposure, fixed income, about 27, 28% plus the real, uh, uh, real estate. Now we run our real estate portfolio as a U.S. core real estate, so behave similar to a bond. So if you look at our portfolio together, we are not that different from a 60, 40 uh, portfolio. So for a 60, 40 portfolio in 1981, during that time, when, when the, uh, the, the happy phase, the expected return is 14.7%. And our discount rate back then was only 8.5%. So the reason for the happy face is that back then the job was easier for the staff to deliver 8.5% when the risk-free rate alone gave you 14% already. Uh, so the staff was happy and uh, the uh, members and beneficiaries and employers would be happy as well because we could uh, uh, easy, uh, easily deliver that return. <coughs> but today's environment, if you look at the lower left hand, so that's where today, where we are. So if you're using the same methodology, today's nominal expected return going forward, using 60-40 uh, portfolio, only public asset only, it was 4.3%. However, our assumed rate of the return is 7%. So there is a gap, it's about 3% gap already. So the, tail, uh, the, the headwind today is about 3%. Back in 1981, the tailwind is about 6%. Uh, so that's why we meant, uh, that's why uh, we say the return for the next 10 years is less likely to be as good as the past 10 years. Mr. Meng, do you want to take questions as you go or wait till the end? Uh, I can take questions. Okay, yeah. we have one for you. Ms. Brown. 
Thank you. Can we go back to slide three? <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, sorry. So um, in our board packet, we don't have the uh, year um, 11 to 60 years, 8.3% expected return. <clears throat> so, um, so what's going to make returns go up? So for the next 10 years, they're going to be 6.1 on average, and then they're going to go for year 11 through 60 to 8.3%. So what do we expect to change in the market, assuming we don't change our asset mix? So what, in this case, the 8.3% from 11 to 60 years is really a long run average. So in the long run, if you look at this chart, we're assuming that we will move back to somewhere a more comfortable place, and then we can start earning 8% uh, of return. But currently, because we are in a lower left-hand corner, the forward-looking return is lower than the long run average. So we think that the Fed funds are going to change their rates on interest? I mean, what's going to get us to 8.3%? I'm just trying to figure out what would they... I just came off of a, a week at Wharton on investment strategies, so would love to talk to you about convexity and all other kinds of things, but uh, why don't you just tell me what we think is going to happen in 11 to 60 to get us to that higher number? Uh, that probably is better to be addressed by our actual office, who formulated a long-run return. Okay, well, you know, we can wait to answer that. It's not that simple. I thought it was going to be a simple answer. Yeah, okay. so Ben, I think she's asking, so if we're assuming we're going to hit seven, but the CMA is, say, 6.1, do we have any specific strategies that we think gets us closer to seven? So what are you thinking about that delta? Well, that's the question we think every day, every waking moment of the investment okay. office. So that's not an answer that I can give you a simple answer. Uh, that will be an ongoing project for years to come. Great. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mr. Perez. Uh, ben, uh, Mr. Meng, sorry. Uh, you said if you take out the administrative costs, so, so I'm confused, Is are these return rates uh, net? Yes. So the 7% the for the long run, 6.1% for the next 10 years is net, net of uh, uh, administrative expense. Okay, and then the second thing is I appreciate the happy faces, because uh, <laughs> that way I know which way to look. Thanks. <laughs> Let, let's all hope for that. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Oh, what, one more. Thank Mr. You. Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mang. Uh, my question goes to the impact of all of this. Uh, we have our discount rates and our expected returns, and if we don't achieve those returns, uh, it flows through and affects our funded status. Yes. Uh, and so, and I think it's important to note that if, when we have a 7% discount rate and we get five and we lose money that, uh, let's say, 2% drop, then it's going to take more than 2% to get us back to where we were. Correct, correct. Because of the transaction where if you got a dollar and you right. lose 50% of that, you go to 50 cents. And you go 50% up, you don't go back to a dollar, you go to 75 cents. Correct, correct. So that, it had, why it takes so long, how, what's this uh, long period of time to regain that, that money that we lost? Because it's not going to be in the same length of time because you're now dealing with a lower base. So how does that play into to your... Yeah, so if you may, we have another slide uh, okay. later just specifically to address that question. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Taylor. Sure, and I just wanted to ask, so the, as we were looking at your um, graph with your happy face and sad face, uh, the nominal expected return back in 1981 was 14.7. There was uh, a discount rate of 8.5%. Um, bonds were making more money. What's, can you give us a little background, just sort of oh. for our folks, on uh, why that was? Yeah. So that was, uh, if you remember, um, in the uh, 70s and 80s with the hyperinflation, and that was Paul Walker trying to fight uh, to rein in inflation. So he raised interest rates very aggressively, and uh, so which caused a recession. When recession happens, uh, the asset class tends to be cheaper. So that's why during the recession time, the equity, you see the y-axis, offers very attractive return. And that's, talk, that's I guess, from the point that I would like to discuss in the second half of the slide. When the recession happens, when the crisis happens, 
uh, first, let's make sure that we can pay our bills. And on top of that, make sure we can generate some liquidity or dry powder on, um, so that we can deploy. We can deploy and take advantage of the market dislocation during time of crisis. Excellent. So that what happens during the, uh, that was Paul Walker raising interest rates cause a recession. And uh, normally when the recession happens, you lower interest rate. But the fact that he raised the interest rate to cause a, uh, re a recession, that was the time interest rate was really high, 14, above 14%. Mm -hmm. And we were only trying to earn 8.5%. So it was much easier back then. You could have just you know, buy the government bonds and uh, you know, in absence of uh, or reinvestment risk or the drawdown risk. So um, you still, even with the reinvestment risk, with 14% uh, treasury yield, you're trying to earn 8.5%. Which we would have come out in much better place, which kind of leaves us in a situation now because we're already at low interest rates. There isn't a lot correct to do yes. if a downturn occurs. Exactly, exactly. But I will also say, and I just, I, I'm, because this sounds all very scary for our members. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, we've been talking about this 6.1% um, return for the last couple of years, three years or so. Yes. So we're working our way out of it. <laughs> And, and we, I, I also I do, yeah. want people to remember we've had good return years for the last few years, and I think it's important that we, um, this is not an exact science. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Middleton? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, looking ahead to the next 10 years, are you more concerned about inflation or deflation? I personally am more concerned about deflation. Um, but there's a later, I have a slide on that one as well. All so right. where we are going from here today is really two extremes. One is the Australia scenario, and the other, the other one is the Japan scenario. So these are two extremes, and probably we are somewhere in, uh, in, uh, in between. Knowing the impact that taking the discount rate from 7.5% to 7 had on uh, municipalities across the state, uh, seeing a 6.1% number is uh, uh, concerning. I'm, I'm looking for the right word, and yeah. it's not coming. Uh, scary is uh, only the beginning. Um, my, my, I guess my point is that um, don't, no need to be scared, but we need to stay focused. Focus on doing uh, the right thing, the most effective and impactful thing for the portfolio. Go ahead, Mr. Meng. Yeah. Okay, so the second topic of uh, this agenda item, what is the market drawdown? What, uh, what can drawdown do to us? And uh, what can we do uh, to prepare for a market drawdown? Simply put, there's no uh, commonly accepted definition. What is a market drawdown? But uh, we like this definition from uh, Wikipedia. So putting it plain, uh, plainly, a drawdown is a pain period experienced by an investor between a peak and a subsequent valley uh, of the uh, stock return. So we like this definition because it also highlights the element of pain, means that the drawdown and how long the market stay low, uh, uh, the, the duration of the market drawdown. So we define market drawdown as a 20% market decline for uh, a period of longer than three months. So as you can see that since 1987, we have three such market drawdowns uh, by our definition. And market drawdown tends to coincide with uh, economic recessions. You see the uh, gray bar, that's uh, economic recessions, but it does not have to be always at the same time. As you see the uh, 1987 market crash, uh, the market drawdown, that did not come with a recession. The recession came in 1990 and 1991 when the tech bubble bursted. So that's what our definition for drawdown. So why do we care about drawdown? So this goes back to uh, Mr. Zhong's question just a moment ago. If you look at the pension buck, the pension dollar, 59% of the uh, benefits uh, uh, payments are from investment returns. And uh, we manage the 50, 59%. And if there is a drawdown, a large drawdown, in the 59 cents of the portfolio, it will negatively affect the 28 cents and the 13 cents, which is the employer and uh, the uh, uh, employee contributions. So we care about drawdown deeply uh, because we 
view this as a shared responsibility, and it is our responsibility to manage the 59 cents of the dollar as prudently uh, uh, as possible and to mitigate drawdown. So we care about drawdown uh, deeply, and uh, we are vulnerable to drawdown. And I want to say something, that we are vulnerable to drawdown by choice. And what do I mean by that we are vulnerable uh, to drawdown by choice? Because there are no other options. This is the best option we have. So why do I say that? You first look at the uh, top, uh, on the left, the top box, the underfunded status. So there are two main reasons. One, we are our underfunded status, currently we have uh, funded status about 70%. And in order to close the funding gap, and uh, at the same time maintain the affordability of uh, the pension system to our uh, employers and members, we have to take on risk in the portfolio to close the funding gap. And then the other reason is, as I just showed you, that our assumed rate of return is 7%, and the risk free rate of return today is 2.5 to 2.25 to 2.5 percent, so that there is a gap of 4.5 percent right there. So in order to make up that difference, we have to take on risk. So because of our underfunded status as well as our high assumed rate of return relative to risk-free rate, we have to take on more risk in the portfolio. However, for a risky portfolio, that comes with a potential for larger drawdown. So that's what I meant by we are vulnerable to drawdown by choice, because there are no other better choices. And we are, potential, we are more vulnerable to a larger drawdown because of the riskier portfolio. Uh, what com what uh, compounds the challenge is that the timing market drawdown is not predictable. So what do we do? So if there's a one takeaway for the entire presentation today, I would like to think about these two, uh, the, the last two points. So in this case, what do we do? Drawdown is very Im uh, impactful. We care about drawdown. And we're vulnerable to drawdown by our choice. And the timing of drawdown is not predictable. Then what do we do? So first thing we do before the drawdown, we establish a plan. And then during the drawdown, make sure we stick to the plan. So that's what we should do. And again, as I said, if there's one takeaway for this entire presentation, this will be the point I will come back again later, over and over again uh, in the later part of the presentation. So this is a real example, recent example, why we care about drawdown. Again, back to uh, Mr. Jung's question. So this is, uh, if you look, this is S&P 500 uh, uh, total return uh, from October 2007 to March 2012. As you can see that from October 2007 to March 2009, where is the lowest point? S&P, in that one half years period, S&P 500 lost 50%. And to earn that 50% loss back for the next, four, uh, for the next three, three years, from March 2009 to March 2012, the market had to earn 100%. To just to make it back to where it, were, uh, where it was in October 2007. So this is a asymmetric of return. You need a 100% gain to make up a 50% loss, and that was uh, Mr. Jones' point. So for these four and, a half, four and a half years from October 2007 to March 2012, we lost the opportunity to compound our asset at 7.5%. Back then, our assumed rate of return is 7.5%. Uh, so basically, in the four and a half uh, years period, we made a, a round trip, but we lose the opportunity to earn a 7.5%. What makes it even worse is that you look at the top line, the dotted red line, uh, the dashed line. That is uh, our liability. For the same time period, liability never experienced a drawdown. Net, net liability just continued to grow. So not only we lost the opportunity to compound our asset at 7.5%, uh, on the flip side, the liability continued to grow. So the net result is that our funding, uh, funding status decreased and uh, contribution rate increased. So that's another reason why we care about drawdown deeply. So now I have uh, concerned you enough with the negative impact of a drawdown. What is really like, likelihood of a, of, of a drawdown? So. On average, the economic cycle, I say, about 10 years. So you have, you have six or seven years in good, uh, uh, good time, and then you have two to three years, uh, very bad time. So that's a drawdown time. So lo let's say that on average, that's the case in history. So that what we call the un unconditional probability of a drawdown for the next 12 months is about 
So this is unconditional probability, means that you are not conditioned on anything, your prior of where we are on the economic cycle. However, if we believe that we are in late cycle, the conditional probability for a drawdown in the next 12 months is much higher. The recent estimate by New York, uh, New York Fed is about 30 percent, and uh, the, the latest estimate by San Francisco Fed is 44 percent of a drawdown in the next 12 months. And it is important to know that you know the estimates are based on history and backward looking, so it's only if history is any indication. Uh, going forward from here, it, as you hear from the news a lot, is that you know we are on becoming the longest economic recovery in the United States in the history of the United States. Uh, from here going forward, as I said, that you know the outcome of our economic recovery has a wide range of outcome as well, but bounded by two extremes. On the upper end of the extreme, the good end, you know, uh, extreme is Australia, that has experienced an economic recovery for close to 30 years since 1990, 1991, and is still counting. So that is the uh, uh, good end of the extreme. On the bad end of the extreme is Japan, after all, close to 30 years, still has not fully recovered from its economic downturn in 1990 uh, and uh, 1991. Uh, so you have these two extremes, that's what we've seen, we haven't seen in the past 30 years. Um, so this is the uh, range of the outcome uh, we are experiencing. And uh, yes, it is true that again we are on uh, our way becoming the longest economic recovery on the U.S. Uh, his, in the U.S. history, and uh, the the when you hear that uh, news, most people are implying that the drawdown is near, it's coming. But we also know that economic recovery does not have to die of old age either. So what's going to happen from here? We need to, we all we hope that our economic recovery can be as long or even longer than the one that Australia is experiencing. But we have to acknowledge that we are in an uncharted, uncharted uh, uh, territory. The reason is that if you look at in a, a lot, the past three recessions in the 1991, 1990-1991, uh, the Fed cut 5.75% to stimulate the economy. In the 2000-2001 uh, recession, the Fed cut 4.25% to stimulate the economy. And in the recent global financial crisis in 2008, the Fed cut 5% and then also uh, engage in a large amount of uh, quantitative easing. And according to an uh, estimate by Bloomberg, that will put the cut in the most uh, recent global financial crisis in 2008 of 7.75%. And one of the reasons I said that we're in uncharted territory now, currently the uh, uh, fight fund rate is 2.25 to 2.5%. So basically we don't have another 7.75% to cut to stimulate the economy should the next drawdown, next crisis uh, comes. And the other thing is the quantitative easing. The capacity of a quantitative easing is not unlimited. So when the next drawdown comes, monetary policy is less likely to be effective. So that's what we mean that we, uh, uh, we are in uncharted territory. So now I have concerned you enough about drawdown. What, ha what have we been doing to prepare ourselves uh, for the drawdown and what we are continuing to do to prepare ourselves? So what, have, what has already been done to prepare for a drawdown? So the first, uh, we lowered the discount rate from 7.5% to 7%. And uh, secondly, we have a new asset allocation. The, this new asset allocation really started from uh, the 2017 asset liability management uh, workshop. And at that time, it's this body, the investment committee, under the, the, then, uh, the leadership uh, um, back then, you adopted portfolio priority, you adopted mitigating uh, equity market drawdown as the top portfolio pr uh, priority. And because of that decision uh, by you, directed the staff to review the major asset classes, global equity and fixed income from the perspective of uh, uh, equity market drawdown, the ability to, meet it, uh, to mitigate equity market drawdown, and uh, which led to the asset segment work. Um, without uh, going back into details again, uh, I'm very uh, pleased to report to you that that work adopted by you and uh, you know, encouraged by you for the staff to work on 
uh, has performed uh, exactly as we expected during, uh, since it was uh, implemented, which is to mitigate the drawdown of, of uh, 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 to mitigate the impact of a market of a market drawdown. Uh, in addition to the new asset allocation, we also negotiated six billion dollars capital injection from the state, and we also shortened the amortization uh, schedule from 30 years to 20 years. So all these actions together really put us in a better place uh, uh, in preparing ourselves for the next uh, inevitable market drawdown. Uh, here, I also I would like to highlight that this is a showcase of a partnership. This is we have achieved all this is really a partnership between you, the trustee, uh, us, the staff, employers, employees, and policymakers. And we should continue to uh, uh, we should continue to foster this kind of partnership to bring the best for the system. So, what? So I just showed you what has been done. You know, between the trustee, between the staff, and the employer, employee, and policyholders, what else are we are working on? So, in order to answer that question, it's important to see what could happen. What are the awful things could happen during a market drawdown? So, at least four of them. The first thing is that we run out of money. When the market drawdown comes, we cannot pay our bills. We cannot fulfill our obligations. And the second one is that we miss opportunity to take advantage of market dislocations. Uh, remember the happy face that I showed you a moment ago during the 1981 recession? The reason happy face is because if you had the dry powder and the courage to deploy capital at that time, you, could, you would have earned a higher return. So in order to do that, you want to make sure that when the market drawdown comes, you, have, you do have the dry, pow uh, dry powder uh, on hand. So the first two things. So these are two awful things, either run out of money uh, to pay bills, or you just don't have money to take advantage of uh, new opportunities. In order to mitigate this impact, we, we are developing a proactive and a comprehensive liquidity management and action plan. So this plan, the ongoing project we are working on, this actually is the first project uh, for the investment office We know They will tell you that this is the first uh, project, very first project I asked uh, on my very first day uh, when I returned to CalPERS. And currently it's uh, sponsored by MID uh, Kevin Winter and uh, led by uh, a group of uh, people from uh, various departments at CalPERS, such as Michael Cream, uh, Robert Patterson, uh, uh, Dan Avenue is ensuring that all the resources are needed because it is so important for us to be ready for the next market drawdown. And uh, 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 Eric Beckerson and his team is all involved, the fixed income team is all involved. The last two awful things could happen in a drawdown is that we cannot maintain our risk profiles. When the market drawdown comes, we panic. We cannot maintain our desired risk profile in the portfolio. And the last thing is we panic. You know, we sell assets that crystallize loss. So the last two, we can mitigate the impact of the last two by having a strong policy and guide, uh, guidelines. So these are, to the, these are to make sure that we stick to the plan when the crisis comes. To deal with the first two, we need to develop a plan. And to deal with the last two, we need to stick to the plan when the crisis comes. So what else uh, uh, can we do? So as I said, at our preparation, we develop an action plan of what to do, and equally important, what not to do. And we implement, implement a centralized liquidity and leverage management. So this project started already even before uh, I came back. And again, this is led by Eric Bex and his team and the entire uh, investment office. So we're making progress in this uh, important project already. Then we also implement a more real-time monitoring and scenario analysis. So that's part of the project that I am personally very deeply involved with. We uh, also. After we review all these, we may need to update some of our investment policies to allow for a faster response. Because most of our investment policies and guidelines are designed for normal times, not for the crisis times. So that's our preparation. And then plus your partnership. So what I mean by your partnership is that we work together, we develop, develop a plan together. So we, well, we all be part of the plan. And then when the crisis comes, we all support the plan during the drawdown. So with our planning preparation and your partnership, we have a strong defense against a market drawdown. But it's very important to note that all, with all these actions, 
We can only mitigate the impact of drawdown. We are not going to eliminate completely the impact of drawdown. So just follow on um, what Mr. Bailey just presented to us. Uh, he touched upon drawdown again. And now let's do a quick review. What are the undesirable things or outcome would happen in a drawdown? As I said, one, you run, we run out of money. We cannot pay our bills. And the other one is that we don't have money to take advantage of uh, market dislocation normally presented during time of crisis. So then number one and two. And to mitigate that, our plan is to develop a plan. And uh, we can mitigate the impact of number one, number two. Number three and four, the undesirable outcomes is uh, we cannot maintain our desired risk profile, or we become panic and then we sell assets <coughs> that is the worst time possible. To prevent that from happening, uh, once we have uh, developed a plan, let's stick to the plan. So that's the key takeaway point, develop a plan now and then stick to the plan during the crisis. So this slide we covered already, and uh, this just highlight what not to do during the crisis on the right is equally important as what to do uh, what to do during the crisis. Since we shouldn't do during crisis, one, we should not succumb to common investment behavioral biases, and two, we should not allow a deviation from predetermined plan without a very strong justification. We are not saying that once we have a, a plan set in stone, we have to mechanically, draconically follow the plan regardless what uh, the future is. But to change a plan, we have to have a pretty strong justification why we are changing the plan. So this is my last slide. It's really uh, this a poster in my office for those of you who have been in my office recently. And this is a, actually is a gift to me from uh, Marcy and the executive team uh, to welcome uh, us coming back, mm -hmm. which is keep calm and carry on. And somehow my uh, dear uh, esteemed executive colleagues expected the water will be a rough water, rough sea ahead of the investment office, uh, the markets. And uh, the reason we can keep calm, because we have been anticipating and preparing ourselves for a drawdown. So when the drawdown actually comes, it won't be a surprise to us. So that's the reason we can keep calm. And the other reason we, uh, the reason we can uh, carry on is, that, again, because we have a plan, and we know that we have a plan that's developed or encompass uh, all possible different scenarios. Well, I shouldn't say all possible different scenarios that we can, th which I should say, I should have said all the scenarios we can think of. We have a plan that cover all the scenarios. Then we just carry on the plan. So again, it's to develop a plan to prepare ourselves before the crisis comes and then stick to the plan during, uh, uh, during the crisis. And with that, we can mitigate the impact of a drawdown, not to completely eliminate the impact of a drawdown. So with that, uh, we're open for questions. Very good, thank you, Ms. Paquin. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a question about a comment you made earlier uh, in the presentation where you said something along the lines of maybe possibly changing the policies, investment policies, to be able to react a little bit more quickly in that kind of situation. Just curious what kind of an example of a change that would be. Yes, a very good question. So, um, for example, look at one of the things, uh, the, one of the undesirable outcome during a drawdown second is that we don't have money to uh, deploy to take advantage of market dislocation. And uh, one of the ways to generate additional liquidity uh, is put on leverage on the total fund. So we borrow money. Uh, that will affect our total fund leverage policy. And so currently, as we are prepare, developing uh, emergency plan, we're looking into the in potential impact on the total fund leverage policy. And it may impact uh, the total fund uh, risk policy uh, uh, as well. So that we don't know yet. As we are pr uh, developing the plan, we'll discover more and more, and we plan to come back to you uh, to ask you for uh, any, if there's any policy change. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ortega. Thank you. Um, my question may be for Marcy as much as for Ben, but it's about um, how the plan uh, will then lead to maybe a communications plan and kind of a, a strategy for um, being ready for the pressure that will come from the outside. So when you have the crisis, there's a lot of pressure. What are you doing? What are you doing? And there's an expectation that you're doing something different rather than doing what exactly you had in your plan. So I just kind of want to hear what your thinking is on that. 
So the way that we do um, most of the work around, whether it's in the investment office or if it's the liability side with Scott Tarando and his team, is once they have landed on the analysis that it then gets presented to this to this board. But we also bring in public affairs at that time to create uh, communication materials. And then our stakeholder engagement team will go out and meet directly with stakeholders. We meet with them on a regular basis, both with the employer uh, roundtable, actually all three, the employer roundtable the labor roundtable, and then we do a retiree roundtable. And so our public affairs office will help us create communication materials that can be shared in those venues. Um, but it will start with, in this case, the investment team working with us in public affairs, and then through the board and through these various channels out to the stakeholder groups. Yep. So that's a very good uh, observation. A uh, uh, great question from you. So as you see this slide, we uh, specifically call your, your partnership, and not just this board, it's all the stakeholders, so that we develop the plan together, we own the plan together. Uh, as I said, that one of the famous, uh, I believe, is Republican lawmaker, many years ago said something really stuck with me. He said that if, if you want me to be with you in lending, make sure you include me in taking off, right? So all the stakeholders, when the crisis comes, we all have the, we're all, all human, we have the tendency uh, to succumb to a lot of, a number of uh, behavioral biases. So the more we can bring the stakeholders along with us and keep them informed that uh, as we develop the plan, the share with them the plan as much as we can so that all the stakeholders will stick with us and support the plan during the crisis. So your, your question or comment is a very good one that we do need uh, uh, um, to have a communication plan alongside with the uh, investment plan to prepare ourselves for the next drawdown. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Yes, I wanted to thank Ms. Ortega for asking that question because uh, those are one of my concerns as well. I just want to make sure, and Ben, you sort of um, answered the question, the question already, but I just want to make sure as we are coming up with these decisions, our plans, that at each stage of the strategy we are involving communications so that we that we have a broader strategy for that communications. It's always been my concern that we don't tell our story well enough, and I want to make sure that we get our story out there, because we're going to be scaring a whole lot of folks when we're talking about drawdowns, and it's very important that we get the whole story out there first before everyone else does. Yes. Thanks, Ben. Ms. Middleton. Yes, thank you, and I appreciate the plan. I think. We're going forward in a very good direction. Uh, but we need to start that communication now and not when the drawdown occurs. And one feature of that clearly needs to be a very candid discussion of why we are in a better condition uh, to deal with the drawdown this time than we were in 2008 and 2009, and that includes uh, complete candor around what happened in 2008 and 2009. Mm -hmm. So one of the communication products that we put together, because we are getting a lot of questions from the employer community, the member community, around the discount rate change, the change in the amortization. So we put together what's called the Solid Foundation for the Future Report. Mm -hmm. um, I could see us, you know, phase two as Scott's coming in November with the risk report, um, primarily on the liability side, that this would feed into another piece similar to the Solid Foundation for the Future. And then we would go out and stakeholder that like we did that report. So I, I went out and did an employer tour. We did a media tour, did a legislative tour, did a stakeholder tour, making sure that everyone understood what we were thinking about in that moment. And today is the first presentation that Ben has done on drawdown <coughs> risk, and that will kick these next series of events off. Ms. Pascal Rogers. I want to just thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really want to thank uh, Mr. Meng and uh, Ms. Ross for this opportunity. Being um, it, one, it was learning experience, but it also freaks the heck out of me when I think about the curve and everyone's still smiling. But I, I really appreciate preparedness, and I really appreciate kind of the, the opportunity to, to you speak and then this report in November. I agree with everybody. I think we need to be really robust and maybe not wait till November, but maybe do little tidbits of communications out to groups because, you know, we just don't know what we don't know. 
And the more we even get out there, even just in newsletters, in your meetings, but something that even can be online for uh, employers and members, legislators, all the stakeholders, I think will will help familiarize themselves. Because like myself, it's not going to be one time looking at the, right. the video. I'm going to need to pay attention, and it'll be a few times. And so I, I really appreciate today, but think it would be really helpful for us to just every month maybe have something. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just also want to echo what my colleagues have said to thank you, uh, the staff, uh, for executing uh, uh, the decision by the Investment Committee in 2016-2017 to get us to this point. Because as I recall, when we were debating and discussing these elements, we were getting pushed back then that that's not the right thing to do, but here you are. We, if we had not taken these steps, we would not be in the same position that we are today. So I just want to uh, uh, thank <coughs> staff for, for, for that. Also, the communication piece, um, uh, for example, last year uh, when we had a, a fiscal year return of 8.6 percent, I had several calls being the chair of the investment committee at the time. Well, why did you only have 8.6? and X pension fund had 10 and another pension fund had nine. And I said, well, what's their funded status? Oh, they were 100% funded. I say, there it is. When you are that well funded, you could take more risk. And so we were funded at the time back in 16 at 61%. Uh, we could not take the risk. And you've highlighted many of those elements today. So we need to keep letting people know that you can't just compare a number. You got to look at under the hood, if you will, to understand why you are making those kind of returns based on your financial condition. So thank you very much for, for making this happen. Good point. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you again, Mr. Meng, and all the work <clears throat> that's gone into this from staff and everything. It's, it's really appreciated. And I would just also, as Henry did, echo my colleagues' concerns that the communication of this is is going to be a, a big challenge, I think, for us organizationally, for each of us as board members. And for me, one of the biggest parts of that challenge is it's challenging enough for me to keep my focus on that long-term time horizon of a long-term strategic investor being, uh, you know, 30, 50 years out when all the pressures and all the perspectives of most of the folks I talk to, our, our members, our stakeholders, are much shorter time frames for their decision making, their political survival, just the changes and coming and going of leadership in you know state and municipal government, all those things that are on these much shorter time scales. So to the extent we can try to find the, the commonalities of messaging to try to make this relevant to them in the present day to help them understand our long-term perspective with trying to look forward and recognize the kind of dramatic changes in the marketplace. I mean, uh, changes that just in the, the few years since I was a grad student, it's like, wow, never would have ever guessed or predicted some of the kinds of changes in, in where we are today that, you know, the, the pressure from them is often just from the rear view mirror. It's like, you know, why weren't you guys in Bitcoin, you know, <coughs> kind of stuff that, that we get. So um, great job and going forward, the, the more that you can provide us in terms of help uh, resources and information and packaging and messaging so we can kind of speak with one voice um, will be really, really helpful. Thank you. Ms. Ma. Thank you very much. And um, I would agree. And also, I don't know if your presentation is on the website, uh, but along with the presentation, I would also put the video um, of Ben speaking because sometimes, you know, reporters will go, oh, my God, draw down. And then they just look at a slide, but you know, the better ones will actually take time and listen, you know, to your presentation because sometimes what looks like, um, you know, what's on a slide may not be exactly what the interpretation is. So I would say, you know, for any of these 
tough issues, you know, when they happen and people get alarmed and, you know, reporters call, it's best to keep the video also along with the PowerPoint. But good job, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your presentation. And everyone up here is absolutely right, but I don't want, I want you to focus on the, uh, on the happy face <laughs> and, the, and let Marcy and her team worry about the uh, outreach. Deal. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good deal for Marcy, though, but it's a deal for me. <laughs> All right, seeing nothing else, anything else on item nine, Mr. Ming? Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you, that brings us back to item eight.